Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 116 scale radio controlled late production German Tiger 1. Now unlike many of the other smaller scale builds that are found on the ECA channel in which those builds are built for private commission and belong to a private customer, this model that we have here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these videos, I often take on commission build projects from vehicles ranging from 135th scale all the way up to 1 6th scale. As for availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. Now, the model in this video has had a lot of upgrades and modifications that were made to the base starter kit not only with the detail aspect but also a lot of repairs and mechanical changes were made as well. Stay tuned because we're going to be going over all of these features and modifications in this video. Before we go any further with the video let's go ahead and take a quick walk around the model. And this vehicle here is the late production German Tiger 1 heavy tank. Like I've mentioned in a similar video the late production Tiger 1 was the final production variant of the Tiger 1 family. What separates this variant of the Tiger 1 compared to its earlier iterations is that on the late production Tiger the vehicle's design has been streamlined and refined to its apex point. Anywhere where the Germans can save on every ounce of raw materials was utilized with this tank's design, as well as any little feature or little gizmo that was featured on the original iterations of the vehicle, which weren't deemed necessary, were pitched, and were completely erased. Now when the vehicles were first developed, of course the Maybach HL210 V12 was the engine of choice. During the end of the early and into the mid-production phase of the Tiger 1's production life, the HL230 started to be incorporated and phase out the vehicles with the earlier HL210. However, by the time the late production Tigers were in full production, the HL230 was the only engine that was ever used on this vehicle. Along with the exclusivity of the HL230, other changes that were made to the vehicle included a simplification of the axis hatch into the engine compartment with the deletion of the snorkeling capability this led to a simplification of the entire engine hatch itself rather than having the need of having several duplicate locking clamps to hold the engine hatch down under water pressure these were all omitted, which of course now saves not just time in production, but also raw materials as well. The need to having a air intake that can be removed and tightened close to the engine hatch was completely, again, redesigned. In its place, a smaller all-cast unit was utilized. Some areas where the design was also tweaked in order to save on both time and resources had to do with the removal of one of the headlights and the relocation that the headlight is now mounted in the center of the glasses plate, the deletion of the tank's external mounted toolbox, another aspect of the design that was redesigned was the rear idler wheel. Unlike the earlier renditions, which utilized a larger diameter wheel, for the later production units, a smaller wheel was incorporated. A similar design change was also made to the tank's main gun muzzle brake. Again, on the later production units, the muzzle brake design is smaller in profile compared to its earlier counterpart. Another slight modification was also made to the tank's main sprockets. Unlike the earlier units, which had a very large diameter domed hubcap found on the turning. On the late production units this was faced off with a flat appearance with a different set of fastener locking arrangements. Another design change had to do with the track links themselves. Unlike the earlier versions of the Tiger 1 track, the ones found on the late production units featured ice cleats on them. This design here was reminiscent to the same exact features which were incorporated to again both the King Tiger as well as the Panther G. Outside of the simplification from many of the tank's features, the vehicles also started to get many of the fittings and components 
which were being utilized on other German tanks of the period. If you look closely at one of these late production tanks, you will see components that are shared by both the King Tiger as well as the Panther. On the late Tiger one, this would include the addition of two towing claws, which were absent on the Tiger one's design previously, but are featured prominently on both the King Tiger and the Panther. This is also seen on the tank's turret. The turret Commander's Cupola is very similar, if not identical, to the one found on the King Tiger. This was a change compared to the earlier rendition of the Tiger I, which utilized a high-profile Commander's Cupola. When the vehicles were in combat, it was deemed that the higher profile was actually a shot trap and was an aspect of the design that could have been changed. Another feature that was cross-platform had to do with the tank's loader's hatch. The loader's hatch found on the late production Tiger is the same unit found on the King Tigers. This of course differs from the earlier units which utilized their own proprietary hatch. Most notably the number one visual cue on the late production Tigers has to be the road wheels. This is another one of those aspects which was a huge benefit across the board from resources to simplification of the design to also even logistics. The earlier versions of the Tiger I featured a steel row wheel with a external rubber tire. With rubber being a very scarce resource that Germany had of this period, they went ahead and changed the design to the same steel stamped type row wheels which were found on the King Tiger. Of course, the same pattern of wheel was also incorporated to the Panther G, with having one wheel design being used across all three of the main German tanks of the period, this greatly helps logistics as well as also streamlines production. Let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started to get a really good idea not just the contents of the base starter kit but also the condition that this model was in when it was at its project start point. And here's the model at the start of the project. Now for the base starter kit I'll be utilizing this Tegan 116 scale radio controlled late production plastic edition Tiger 1. Now for anyone who's a fan of the channel, this is not the first time that I've built one of these late pattern Tegan Tiger 1s. In fact, I did one a little while ago and that model has a video series up on the ECA YouTube channel in which I describe the work that went into modifying it and getting it to its completed state. This model here is going to follow the same suit. Now this tank here, just like with the other one, started off as a scratch and dent special. Now for those viewers out there who are also fans of the channel, you notice that this is not the first time I've mentioned the scratch and dent in portraying to one of these Tegan tanks. As I often mention in these videos, on the TegenTanks.com website, there is a section devoted to selling models that have been damaged in one way, shape, or form from shipping or their returns that have been refurbished and offered back to the customers. These are called the scratch and dents. In this section here, you will find these models that are offered for a reduced price, however, are sold in an as-is state. This tank here is an, another one of those projects. For me personally, I really enjoy working on these scratch and death models as I get them for a very good price. And on top of that, since I have to modify and tear apart and rebuild the tanks anyway, buying the freshly painted nice addition just doesn't really warrant the cost when I could get the same exact model that I need to repair and rebuild anyway but for a reduced rate. This model itself I acquired a little while ago and has been sitting in the shop for a few months. Now the model was shipped in a larger carton. That carton has since been discarded and it just didn't hold up and there's no point for it to take up space in the shop. Inside that carton is this protective carton that we have here. This is common for the Tegan tanks and every single one I've purchased, including the scratch and dents, come with the protective carton that conceals the retail box on the inside. Opening it up, you will see the retail packaging for that of the Tiger One. Removing it from the box, 
here we can actually see the main retail box. Now this is the type of some this is the type of container that you will see in hobby shops or other retailers that sell and offer the Tegan tanks. The box art is very plain. It's just a monocolor type ordeal. We have the basic cardboard with no other fancy printing on it and just a black and white image of the, an early production taken Tiger One. Now of course this is a late Tiger One and we have the information here labeled on with this little sticker here. Pretty standard packaging and is again typical for these vehicles. Cracking the box open will reveal the model's contents. One thing I have to say that TaganTanks.com does a fantastic job with the actual packaging of their model. They come with all these little shards of sponge, which are very good in keeping everything in place. And now you can start to see the tank with all the sponge that has been removed. With the foam removed, let me start taking and removing the stuff out of the box. Starting with first a box full of 6mm airsoft BBs. Because this model is equipped with an airsoft gun, the BBs are supplied. This is standard for all of the Raider Run 116 scale tanks on the market with the airsoft firing feature. Now Tegan does offer a recoil and infrared version of the same exact model as well. Going to this section here takes us to the details and accessories. First back here we have a pre-painted tank commander as well as some rear fenders, S mines and some other fittings. Also included is a sheet of stickers for that of markings. Some smoke fluid. a little metal bucket and a metal die cast metal MG42. Also included is a bag of metal spare track lines. Moving the protective styrofoam cover takes us to the owner's manual slash little target for that of the BBs. Quite standard. We have here the radio. Now this model here is the older pattern of electronics from Tegan. It is still a 2.4 gigahertz radio and it does have proportional drive. The newer versions are a little bit more improved from this legacy variant. The model also comes with a very basic 7.2 battery charger as well as the 7.2 battery. Now the model was opened up briefly when the tank first arrived and the tank was test driven so the 7.2 is actually sitting inside of the tank at the moment. Normally it's positioned inside of the styrofoam carton. And here's the main model that we have here. Now, like I said before, this is the all plastic version of the late production Tiger, and this model is the Panzer Grey edition. Now, one thing to point out very, very quickly is that these Tiger ones with the late pattern would have never been painted with the Panzer Grey. The Panzer Grey was a more early war type feature, and by the time the late pattern Tigers were developed, the Panzer Grey color scheme was long in the past. Having said that, again, since I'm going to be rebuilding and repainting the model anyway, that's really a moot point. Now, like I said before, the model is the all plastic edition, which means it features all plastic running gear on the wheels, sprocket, idler, as well as the track. The track is the late pattern track with the little ice cleats, which is a nice feature. And the tank does have a full working suspension and overall is a very nice piece. Being a ready to run model, all of the detail and detail fittings are pre-painted and mounted to the vehicle. In terms of the tank's top deck Pioneer tools, 
These here are integrally molded to the top deck and are simply painted at the factory. As for the tank's tow cables, these are pre-painted, weathered, and then mounted to the model. Now, like I said before, the Tegan Tiger One is really nothing more than a product improved variant of the Henlong 116 scale Tiger One. And that model, of course, has its roots back to the old Tamiya 116 Tiger One full option kit. The Tegan model basically took the Henlong variant, made a lot of improvements to it, and then for the late pattern version that we have here, tooled up a few components that are found specifically for late pattern Tigers. This would include like the tank's commander's cupola, the center mounted air blower, the smoke trajector slash S mine grenade launcher, as well as the late wheels, late pattern sprocket, as well as the smaller late pattern rear idler wheel. And of course the later pattern track. Having said all that, the vehicle does feature several inaccuracies, which are both carried over from the Henlong model, like that of the spare antenna tube, as well as other inaccuracies being that the hull is basically still left as an early pattern Tiger, that these features are going to need to be completely removed and deleted in order to bring it up to late pattern specs. Of course, I'll be going over that as the video progresses. Now, as for the actual model itself, as you can see, it's basically in perfect condition or as good as condition as one of these models can be. There is a small little piece missing here on the tow cable, but I'll go over that a little bit more in depth, a little while. Here I have the late, the back portion. The exhaust is popped off and I'm gonna have to do some work on that as well. Now, as for the interior, this is accessed via, via a little latch that is back here underneath the sponson. You hit it and the whole top deck pops off. This is one nice feature I personally like about the Tagans. As for the interior, it is all stock Tagan. One nice feature this one has is the rigidity brace that connects the two sponsons. This is a feature that was absent on the last Tiger one that I've done. Actually, absent on the last two Tagan Tiger ones that I've, I've built. And in the past, these here I've had to fabricate of, out of pieces of bar stock. It's a nice feature that this one already has it pre-installed. As for the gearbox, this one here features the older zinc, or as I like to call it, the glass jaw gearbox. These gearboxes here, they look and have the feel of a high quality gearbox that will last a long time. But in my personal experience, these gears are very prone to breaking and wear out with very quick measure and do not hold up well at all with long-term running. In fact, this is the weakest part of the model and this will be replaced with an aftermarket gearbox. Of course, this is more info to come. Here we have the smoke system. And the battery is actually from a Henlong, the original stock taken battery. Uh, it's probably left around the shop somewhere. The volume control is on this side, which is directly below the driver's hatch, and the main power switch is di directly below the radio operator's hatch. This I've seen standard on many of the Tegan Tiger ones. This here is a little bit of a newer location, as in the past they, they typically are mounted in this area over here. But this is a nice feature that it's in this section because you could adjust the volume without having to take the tank apart. Here's the turret turner. We have here the 180 turn gear mechanism. This is not the 360 with the slip ring and the full 360 rotation. Now this tank being stock does feature the stock features which outside of driving features the smoke system, target rotation, gun elevation, and as well as the airsoft firing capability. There is a headlight as well as bow machine gun fire as well. Now, if anyone's watching this and saying to themselves, but John, like you said before, the exterior of the model looks like it's in perfect condition. Why was this listed in the scratch and dent section? Outside of, of course, a little caveat of a slight little chip here on the transport cable. The answer of that has to do with the tank's electronics. This is not something that can be seen as a physical problem, but it's definitely going to be noticed once the tank is in operation. I'll turn on the tank, fire up the sound system, and you'll see exactly what the issue is. Tank is on. Firing it up. And those popping and hissing sounds are being emitted from the speaker. This is the problem with the tank. 
this tank sound system is completely corrupted and is non-functional. And because the sound card is directly connected and built into the tank's electronics package, you cannot simply just replace the sound card. Now, if anyone is wondering, no, the problem is not a corrupted speaker. I know because I've tried replacing the speaker with a couple spare ones I had on hand, which were fully functional, by the way, and it had the exact same result with the sound. The problem with this has to do with the tank's electronics, which means that the entire electronics package on this model needs to be replaced. Now, this is a simple replacement. Tegan does sell replacement electronic systems, and probably I'm going to upgrade to the more current one, but this is something to change, and definitely something that's going to be talked about more in depth towards the end of the video. Now, in all fairness, this model was a scratch and dent special, and the problem with the sound system was something that was advertised on the listing and I went into this project knowing full well that the electronics package was going to need to have been replaced. Now as for aftermarket replacements, in addition to the gearbox, one of the first things that I also acquired for this model is that of the replacement track, sprocket, and idlers. For these I went ahead and opted for the sets that are supplied on the TaganTanks.com website. Here we have the late pattern of Tiger One track from Tegan. These tracks are exquisitely made and are recommended. In fact, I've used these exact same pattern of tracks on my last Tegan Tiger One build. You can see the inner sections, which like I mentioned on the other video, what's nice about the Tegan track links is that they are arguably better than the Tamiya made track links in that the hinge sections are solid through and through and are not hollow cavity sections which are found on the Tamiya tooling as well as on the stock headlong type pattern of tracks as well. They even have their little mud slits present in them. The tracks are made from die cast metal and again are recommended for this procedure. Now as a side note one thing I have to say about the Tegan uh, tank website that themselves is that when I first purchased these tracks the company made a mistake and sent me early pattern track links. I went ahead and notified the company to which they gave me a prepaid slip to mail the the incorrect tracks back to which then they replaced it with the right ones. In addition to giving me the replacement tracks that I needed they also went ahead and hooked me up with a set of metal tools for that of German tanks, as well as they also went out of their way and hooked me up with two sets here of their aftermarket metal tow cables. The tow cables are a very nice feature found on these taking sets and are made out of real copper cable. The copper material is very flexible and it contorts very well and easily with whatever surface that they are placed on which is definitely an improvement compared to the most other sets which use steel cable which can be a lot more stiffer and rigid compared to the softer pliable material that we have here. As for the eyelets these are made from die cast metal and the sleeves themselves are machined brass. I have two sets of these which is great for any other project that comes along. In addition to the tracks, I also currently have on order a set of the late pattern die cast metal sprockets and rear idler wheels. Unfortunately, at the time I acquired the tank in these parts, these parts here were not in stock and I had to wait quite a while for them to be restocked. Currently, as of the time of filming this video, they are on order and they will be seen, of course, in the next coming scene with the model fully completed. And here's the model just before painting. At this point here, this gives me a great opportunity to pop the hood so you get to see the inside and I could go over some of the mechanical changes that were made to this model.
Starting from the front of the model and working our way back, first takes us to the gearbox. The gearbox that we see here is the Tegan V3 ball bearing steel gearbox. This tank, as well as showcased in an earlier scene, originally utilized the Tegan zinc alloy gearboxes. Those gearboxes, from my experience, wear out very quickly and are really problematic. It's to the point where if you have a tank with those pattern in a gearbox, it would behoove you to replace those gearboxes with something in a steel configuration. In this case here, the Tasian steel V3 gearboxes are highly recommended, and I cannot stress that enough. In fact, I also have a video posted separately of a tutorial on how these gearboxes get mounted into the stock Tegan tank. It's a very simple procedure, but it, if anyone was curious, there is a tutorial out there on how I did it to this exact same model. Moving our way from the gearbox now takes us to the tank's motherboard. As we recall from the unboxing portion, the motherboard that was originally supplied with this model was corrupted and the sound files were severely garbled. That motherboard was replaced with the unit that we have here. This unit here was acquired from TaganTanks.com and is the same pattern of motherboard that was originally in the model. Tegan, I believe, have phased out this system, and because of that, these systems here at the moment are being offered on sale at very low prices. The unit was acquired, dropped directly in, and all the wiring and macroing to the radio was very quick and effortless. The entire setup took less than five minutes to do. From the radio now takes us to the battery. The tank originally came with a 7.2 battery, and the batteries that come with these Tegan tanks are basically on par with the other type of batteries that come with these ready-to-run models. However, rather than utilizing that stock battery, I swapped it out with a high-performance battery with more amperage. This battery here was acquired off of Amazon.com, and I've used the same type of battery in my other 116 scale tank builds. They're highly recommended and can be found at the link listed below. While on the battery, you can see the ECA recharge jack patched in. This system here I typically discuss later on in the video, and this is how you get to charge the tank's battery without having to take apart the tank. This cord here will be hidden under, underneath one of the bow hatches, and when it comes time for charging, you simply emerge it from the tank, charge the battery, and then stuff it away once the battery is recharged. Moving our way rearward now takes us to the smoke system. Now the smoke system is a stock taken unit and was left as is. What was changed, however, was the way the system emits the smoke and how it is refueled. Here you can see how the unit was tied into the ECA exhaust manifolds. I have the two exhaust stacks that emerge and they connect to a central point. I use an aquarium fitting in order to tee it together so it, it the smoke emerges from one of the outlets that are molded into the top smoke emitter. The other hole was modified so instead of it emitting smoke, this has actually been turned into the refueling portion for the smoke system. Just like with the battery, the tank can be refueled from the external portion without having to take apart the tank. The tube runs along the side here and it will actually emit from the driver's hatch. Here I have the filler tube right here. The filler tube has a plug in it so it prevents smoke from emerging from this section over here. When it comes time to refueling you unplug the, the cork so to speak, fill the unit up and then connect it, stuff it back into the hatch like the recharge jack and you're ready to roll. The last modification to point out has to do with this device that we have over here. This unit here is the lighting device for the rear convoy light which is mounted just above the mud flap on the rear of the Tiger 1. The way the system works is via a fiber optic and an LED. The fiber optic, if I could get this in focus, connects to the tail light emerges from the rear hull and runs its way into this little light box. Inside the light box there is a single LED and the LED then has a plug and it patches into another plug that is found on the top deck. This here is patched into the tank's lighting circuitry and the tail light or the convoy light 
works in sync with the bow headlight on the front of the vehicle. Now the way the tube is fabricated is actually pretty simple. The convoy light is integrally molded into the tank in opaque plastic. With a Dremel and a router bit, I go ahead and amputate the center section here, leaving the two wings exposed. I then drill out a portion in the center of the convoy light, and this is where the replacement clear section is going to be mounted. Now for the clear plastic, I actually recycle clear plastic runners from plastic models. The section that gets turned into the convoy light would be this section that we have right over here. I snip away this portion and this portion and the center gets cleaned up and this is what gets inserted into the tank and what makes contact with the fiber optic. Now when it comes time to connecting the two, this is done only with a piece of heat shrink tubing. You cannot use adhesives like super glue or hot glue for combining the fiber optics or for even mounting fiber optics to a light box or to a vehicle. The reason for that has to do with the chemical reaction that superglue has with these fiber optics. Superglue when it makes contact with fiber optics makes them very brittle and they end up cracking on you. And hot glue actually dissolves the fiber optic turning into a goopy mess. The shrink tubing he holds everything together without the use of any need of adhesives and it makes for a nice strong bond. Some white glue is then utilized at the joint over here where the fiber optic enters into the light box. On the back portion we have the LED and the LED is hot glued into the light box. And if you notice I gooped some hot glue around these two sections over here. This acts as an insulator and it prevents the two leads from ever making contact with each other either accidentally or if the wire is being moved around the prongs can possibly bend and making contact can short them out. By adding the hot glue this gives them some more rigidity and can prevent any sort of a short circuit. And here we have the tank going through its final paintwork and it's going to slide into completion. However, before I could do that, this now takes me to the tracks. Now the tracks are the same aftermarket metal late production Tiger 1 tracks that I mentioned before from Tegan. However, before I go ahead and get them into paint, you'll notice that I am washing them in a little bath of turpentine. The reason why I do this is that one thing I noticed about the Tegan tanks is that the tracks have a fine little film of oil that's on the surface. Now some tracks are slightly more than others. These tracks here weren't too bad but as a good precautionary measure I like to give them a alcohol bath or I should say turpentine bath in order to wash off any of the surface oil. You can see from the coloration of the turpentine that there is some oil that has been removed off of this track surface. After the tracks are in their little bath here, I'm going to let them dry overnight, and then I could get them into paint. By doing this, this gives a better surface for the paint to adhere to. And it's a procedure that I recommend for anyone who does these rebuilds of these Tegan tanks and would like to paint the tracks.